Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Hannah. I lead community and email at Grow Class. You've probably seen me in your inbox. So hello, nice to meet you. If you're not familiar with Grow Class, we're a six-week growth marketing course. And we teach founders, marketers, entrepreneurs the skills they need to grow their careers and businesses. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Grow Class, I can drop a link in the chat for you. Take a peek there. But today, I'm really excited to get to learn how to make our websites more profitable with Catherine McKee. So Catherine has been a head of e-commerce for about 16 years. And in that time, she's seen some terrible advice come up again and again and watched it tank brands. So since starting her consulting, uh, she, her clients have an average revenue increase of 600% year over year. They have better margins, more profit, and less stress. Uh, she's made over $200 million in incremental revenue for her clients, and she wants that for you too. So I'm going to be dropping Catherine's links in the chat for you. You can connect with her on LinkedIn and her website. Uh, we'll fix that link after. Uh, if you have any questions, we do have time for a Q&A. So um, feel free to put your hand up or unmute yourself. Uh, we welcome participation today. Um, also, if you're feeling a little bit shy, you can send me a message and I will ask the question on your behalf. A uh, reminder that there's no such thing as a dumb question. We're all here to learn. This is a judgment-free zone. So just ask that you keep it kind and respectful to everyone. And that, with that being said, I'm going to pass the mic, mic over to Catherine to learn how to make our websites more profitable. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone, who's watching this recording eventually. Super, super excited to be here. Super excited that I think a lot of what Morphology does aligns with what Grow Class does in a great way. And I just want your websites to make more money. Um, so... Like we talked about, we're going to do probably like 30 minutes of talking and then 30 minutes of, I have a game that I want to play. You guys don't have to do it if you don't want to. We will pause at the end and be like, do you feel like doing this? If you don't want to, we'll do 30 minutes of questions. If you do want to, it'll be like 15 minutes game, 15 minutes questions. Um, and of course, in the interim, put any questions you want in the chat. Happy to answer them as we go. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to run my deck and we can get started. Okay, how to make your website more profitable. Let's get into it. Um, we already essentially did intros. Hi, I'm Katie, CEO of Morphology Consulting. Um, I, we talked about the incremental revenue. I've been in e-com for about 16 years. I was head of e-com at Cody, Luxottica, worked with IPG Media, served on the Thinkle Google Council. So a lot of the information is gonna be Google focused in this little chat we're going through. Um, I, it is going to apply to all search engines and most algorithms, but I'm gonna use specifically Google just cause that's where I have the deepest experience. So what I would love to go through in this is just kind of talk about how the search algorithms work and how you can use that to increase your profitability. So getting more traffic, getting better traffic and having customers arrive to a site that makes sense for them, makes them want to convert, makes them comfortable. You should walk away from this um, if we make any changes to our sites with better traffic, better conversion and improved margins. So first, just like state of the business. I know some of this stuff gets a little repetitive, but essentially everybody's online. Right, so like why would it matter for your website even if you don't sell goods on a website? So like service providers, people who wanna be famous, promoting a book, et cetera, everybody's online. Everybody's online. 80% of the US population or 263 million people shop online in the US. 55% of those people prefer shopping to in-store. Um, that means for like the final purchase of the good, about 87% of people prefer to look at stuff online and then buy it in-store. So they essentially, they do both. It's trillion dollar business. The US e-com specifically broke $1 trillion in 2022. It was up 11% from 2021, which is kind of fascinating when you think about it from sort of the expected pullback post COVID where people had to shop online and then were like able to get back in store. It still stayed really high because it's comped against a $7 trillion total US retail sales, meaning it's about 15% of current global economy or current US economy, which is a lot. A couple of years ago, it was only one to three percent, right? So, like this, this kind of growth trajectory suggests that people really like finding information and purchasing things online. However, conversion rates are really low, really low. The global conversion rate is three point four percent. U.S. is slightly better at three point six percent for an e-commerce website. So, specifically, a website where you would buy something, not necessarily a website where you would be seeking information. So, conversion in this case means made a purchase, not like did a click, took a quiz, etc. But bounce rate is really, really, really high. Average global bounce rate is 42%, which is abysmal. 
The U.S. is worse at 47 percent. Um, the reason I call this out and I kind of want to double click on a part of this is that bounce rate and exit rate are two different things. Exit rate is the rate at which people came to your website, did something on it, took a quiz, clicked a link, went to another page, read some stuff, moved around and didn't convert. That number is very, very high also in the U.S., but that's positive. A lot of people, the vast majority of people do research online and then buy the goods somewhere else. A high exit rate means that they came to your white and researched stuff. So they, they looked around and in your Google Analytics or whatever analytics tool you use, if, you, if it seems extraordinarily high to you and you want to see what happened and like maybe they didn't find their size, maybe they didn't find the right color, maybe they didn't find exactly the thing they wanted or they're waiting for a sale, that can be useful information, but a high exit rate is fine. You want people on your site not necessarily purchasing immediately. A high bounce rate, on the other hand, bounce rate means they came to whatever page you drove them into and immediately turned around. They didn't do anything. They didn't go somewhere else. They didn't click on anything. They didn't search deeper. They didn't read anything. Bounce rate measures the people who are in the wrong place. They came to your website and it wasn't what they wanted and they immediately turned around. To have that be 47% in the US is shocking. And it's part of the reason that converting people is so difficult in websites. Something is happening to these people that they are being driven to a place that they don't want to be. That is what we're going to try and fix. So first important thing, CAC is constantly rising. Customer acquisition costs are constantly rising. They don't have to be, though. So the difference between CAC online and CAC in store is that CAC in store has a lot of other fixed costs attached to it. So the margins are bad and it's difficult to get people in store because you have to buy really big, broad ads to bring them into the place where you have to pay rent and you pay people's salaries and you have to stock and they're shrink, et cetera. That is by and large a heavy fixed cost. So it's expensive. Digital CAC is driven really highly by people's media spend. And that's a choice. You don't have to pay to play to the second point. You aren't supposed to be buying your traffic. You should have the majority of it for free. You aren't supposed to be serving ads to people as the way that they come to your site. They should know about your brand and they should know about what you offer and the problem that you solve without you having to pay to be in front of them. Which is not to knock ads, not ads can be wonderful. They're great for incrementality. They can be great for launching a new product. They can be great for like adding a little bit of oomph, but you really want your baseline to be mostly organic. How did we get here in the first place? Um, a lot of it is driven by very talented people who have been in a sales space for a long time, understanding the market that they were in. So a retail and wholesale go-to-market is very different from a digital go-to-market. The reason for that is the retailer and the brand don't really share a purpose, <clears throat> right? Like you both want to sell the sneakers but you both want the best margin out of it. You both want the most money out of it. You both want to sort of like win the transaction. <clears throat> Excuse me. The points that you can get margin wise in that scenario are from each other. They're not from the customer, which means that if you're gonna win, the retailer is going to lose and vice versa, a couple of points here and there. It's a very adversarial, emotionally dysregulated environment. There's a lot of, I need something bad to happen to you for it to be good for me. Taking that mindset, which is truthfully, it's a, it's a tough one to survive in for a long time. So the people that are good at it have been doing it for a really long time. They're successful. They take that mindset and then apply it to the digital space, except Google's not in a partnership of any kind with you, not even an adversarial one. They're just a tool. You can use them, not use them. They, they're not interested. To approach it like Google is out to get you or like they're trying to just get ad money from you or like they are stopping people from finding you, they're essentially an inanimate object. It's, it's like opening a door. If you try to pull a push door open, it's just not gonna open. That's frustrating. I did this this morning and it's very frustrating and also kind of embarrassing. And if, to, in fairness, I was mad at the door, but like the door is not mad at me. The door doesn't care about me. The door doesn't think about me at all, right? I did it wrong. That's the experience a lot of us are in with Google, but, when it goes badly and it's expensive and you feel like you have to kind of like fight with them, for a lot of people that aligns to a wholesale and retail go to market. That's exactly what it's like with a retailer. So it feels like known and comfortable to you, but that toxicity doesn't exist with them. They're, they're not doing that with you. They don't need anything from you. 
The second big problem that we run into specifically to D2C and, and some other brands, it impacts D2C the most, is that brands prefer to behave like a tastemaker rather than a problem solver. And that is also historical data, right? Like department stores decide what you wear or did for a very, very, very long time. Whatever they bought is whatever was available. So unless you were gonna make your own clothes, whatever fashions were in fashion is what you were wearing because it was the only thing you could get. And the brand picked it, they made it, you had to buy it or you had to look weird, basically. Again, that mental holdover of like, we the brand know better than the customer. So we will tell the brand what is cool, what is good, what they want, what they need. And we will talk them into it by talking about like our patents or we will have a heavily branded site, which is like in our language and in our colors. And we're very kind of like, we've created this microcosm of brand for you. Um, as politely as possible, customers don't care about your brand at all. It means almost nothing to them. Even ones that are very dialed into an emotional space that they also care about, even then the branding is not even in the top 50 things that they care about when they're trying to make a purchase. What they care about is them. They care about them, their emotional state, their needs, and specifically their problem. So an example that I had with a, a potential client is we were talking about this and she was like, well, she disagrees. Like she buys Lululemon pants to do yoga. She's been a yoga instructor for 40 years. Lululemon didn't make you do yoga. Lululemon has nothing to do with you doing yoga. You needed cute, workout clothes to teach your class in that didn't show your underwear when you bent over and whipped sweat. Lululemon makes that now, for, forgiving the whole like debacle a while ago. And they make nice ones and they last a long time and it's a good quality. None of those things have anything to do with Lululemon's branding, right? Like Lululemon's pictures and the beautiful models and the way in which they take their site to market, nobody cares about that. Do the pants fit? Are they a price that I consider reasonable? Will they last a long time? That's what your customer cares about. So what does Google want from you then? They want to be able to offer you as the right answer. They specifically want there to be only one right answer. Because when you query something, you're thinking of the one thing that you want. You don't want 40 pairs of yoga pants, you want one. If you were looking for the best Thai food restaurant near you, you mean one. You don't need 100, you need the one good one. Google thinks the same way. Search engines are predicated on human behavior. So there is no difference between what is for a human and what is for a search engine. Search engines are measuring what humans are doing with whatever they're given. What that means is that a search engine functionally exists to organize data like a library. So I'm probably really dating myself here, but if anyone's ever physically been in a library and used a physical card catalog or a digital card catalog, you can go in and you can type the thing that you want and you'll just get like a serial number for the book. Sometimes you get like the chapter that your question is in. Instead of having to walk through the entire library to find your question about revolutionary war, like weaving techniques for dresses, which is a thing that you're gonna care about, instead of going through the whole library or instead of reading everything in history or instead of reading everything in American history or American revolutionary war history or everything in textiles, you can just, you can just go to the right book right now, get the chapter you need. Google functions the exact same way. They are taking the whole breadth of data on the internet and they are putting it in easily consumable chunks so that you can find your answer faster. That's what Google is trying to do. Um, however, only 34% of searches end in a click, meaning 66% of the time when someone is querying something that they want an answer to, they don't find the answer. And that number is controlled for things like snippets and knowledge graphs. It's controlled for things you wouldn't have clicked on, like you know, someone's store hours or the address or whatever. This means someone queried a thing and they just couldn't find it anywhere. And likely if you've tried to Google anything recently, you've probably also run across that it's really hard. You have to kind of like refine and refine and refine your search and you like sort of get there and it's hard and it doesn't make sense. And you're trying to remember like that guy from that movie, that time, and you have salient information, but like you're just not getting there. The reason that you're not getting there is that whatever website is hosting that information isn't describing it the way you describe it. And Google can't reconcile them. It can't kind of do the thinking for you. Even the generative AI plugins don't actually do the thinking for you. They just model old behavior. What you need to do for your website is be incredibly clear about what you offer. So Google can just turn and be like, oh yeah, there it is. 
Um, a quick review of how search engines work. I don't know how comfortable everyone is, so I'll do this fast. Um, and if it doesn't make sense, you have a question, just throw it in the chat. Search engines, all search engines. This one is modeled on Google, but all search engines work the same way. It's a three-step looped process, meaning they do steps one through three, and then they just start one all over again. Step one is crawling. It's where we get the name World Wide Web. It's a piece of spider code, and it goes back and forth across all of the internet in a constant loop, just looking at stuff. Looking at stuff, seeing what's out there, seeing if there are any changes, seeing if anything's new, and it's storing information. What it does with that information is then put it into an index or likely several indices, depending on what's on your website. Meaning like what bucket should you be in? So like the example earlier is like, yeah, you're in history, but also US history and also Revolutionary War history and also textiles. Those are all indices to sort of like chunk down the information so that we can get to you faster. You should not be in a lot of indices, but you should be probably in more than one. So we say like five-ish. That's indexing. The next part is retrieval. Retrieval is when someone types a query into a search engine and the search engine turns around to go get the answer. The retrieval process essentially is that it goes back up to the indexes that you listed. So again, back to that Thai food. If I'm saying that I want the best Thai food near me, the indices that the retriever is going to open are things that are highly rated for best, Thai food total, and near me, usually if you're within Google, is about a quarter of a mile from your IP address. So we'll take those three buckets, we'll dump them out. And its expectation and my expectation is that there's only one thing that's in all three of them. There's only one good Thai food restaurant anywhere near me, my physical current address. Um, that's not what happens though. What happens is that Thai food restaurant doesn't come up at all. Unfortunately for that Thai food restaurant that I can physically see from my apartment window, its website is just a PDF and a search engine can't parse an image, which is what a PDF comes up as. So there's no indexable available information on it. So it exists and I can see it and it is highly rated, but Google can't see it. Google, <laughs> Google can't see it. So that Thai restaurant is losing all of its local traffic and it runs a lot of ads. The ads are super expensive because Google doesn't even know if it's true or not. When Google goes to look at its organic rank, it doesn't have one because it's not in the Thai food index. That's a lot of kind of what we're gonna talk about today, how to get your website indexable and rankable for the buckets you should be in so that the retrieval process is faster. I didn't see any questions come up in the chat. Um, why do we care about this? The kind of standard D to C VC playbook for a long time was just buy your traffic, just slap together some meta ads or some Google ads and just kind of like go for it. Um, that is very expensive, one. Two, it's not very functional. And the reason it's not very functional is that less than 2% of clicks go to paid. Meaning that when people are in any of those spaces, they are actively avoiding the ad while they look for their correct answer. So Google doesn't really highly value ads and it's not very functional for them or for their goal. And it's not very functional for your business because you're only reaching the 2% of people that are interested in clicking ads anyway. They might not even be your people. They're just people who like to click ads. That is a gigantic waste of margin because it's not very efficient. So how does Google work for organic so that you don't need as much paid? In the retrieval process for specifically Google now, they have a couple of filters that they put in for what to give you back on your search engine results page. And the first component is that they artificially limit returns. They limit them against what a human being could comfortably consume in terms of content in um, about an hour. It varies by category, which is fascinating to me, but it's what a human being would comfortably consume in like X amount of time. And it averages out to about an hour. Meaning that like the answer should only be one thing and it's definitely not if you've ever Googled anything. But it also shouldn't be like a trillion things because you're not going to read them. So Google tries to sort of like crush it down into like X number of search engine results pages so that you could potentially find it, but in a reasonable amount of time. Most human beings, and it is well under 1%, ever even go to the second page of search engine results. So you do want to be on the first page. That is important. You want to be pretty high on the search page. But the ads, again, where you buy those top placements, most people don't click them. So you do kind of want to be as high as possible without having to pay for it. Now, where you get your number and your rank on the page is against your qualification. So what Google does to decide who makes the cutoff in the returns and what order they give them to you in is they evaluate and rank them in order based on your query. 
So it's in two categories, which is the quality of your website, just in general, like, is it a good, real website? And do you talk about the thing the person queried? So an example of one that would not rank well is if you've ever like Googled Ray-Ban, Ray-Ban gets fished all the time and I feel terrible for them. I also used to work for them, but feel terrible for them. Ray-Ban, the brand used to be like a favorite phishing target for a lot of offshore websites. And so you have a web website that was like Ray-Ban, 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 like $20, $30 Ray-Bans. But the website itself would be like a microsite hosted somewhere or like a landing page. That's not a real website. It doesn't have a good quality rank. From Google's perspective, it's going to look like a phishing site because it's a low quality site with a weirdly high relevance. That is not going to hopefully be delivered to you in returns because it doesn't rank and qualify. So what you need is both. You need a good website that also talks about what people want. The next really big important part of Google's returns process is how aggressively they remove spam. Now spam can be anything that's in the wrong place. Spam is sort of like you're trying to take traffic that is not appropriately yours. So things like keyword stuffing or the various hacks where you would like draft on really long tail keywords that have nothing to do with your business, but like somebody Googled it once. Those type of behaviors are things that the search engine is constantly watching and monitoring you do. And then it's punishing you for them. And then using punish a little liberally, it wants you to stop doing it because it's not good for the searcher. So like back to what we talked about earlier, a lot of things you Google now, you get back to sort of like malarkey answers. They have nothing to do with what you Googled. And like your Google wasn't bad. It wasn't a weird query. You phrased it pretty well. It makes sense. You have the important keywords in it and you still don't get the thing that you needed. A lot of that is due to the hacks. A lot of that is due to sort of creative marketing that is going to get you rank against something you shouldn't rank for, which Google writes a lot of updates to stop. So probably you are familiar with several of the various um, updates that have come through. They, they come through all the time. So there are like some big ones, some small ones, et cetera. But Google is constantly kind of refining the search algorithm. I'm going to make a note here that algorithms don't change. So I do want to say that Google, Google's purpose and the algorithmic structure is the same forever. What Google wants is to find the one right answer. People love to do hacks and love to do kind of like shady stuff to sort of like steal traffic that's not theirs. When Google writes an update, it's to stop that behavior. But Google is not going to stop being a search engine. That is its point. And I think a good easy way to think about it is like a road. Like roads are built every day. The point of a road is for people to traverse point A to point B pretty safely. If people misbehave on a road, if people are like speeding or stopping abruptly or taking weird turns or doing weird U-turns, the city will add stuff to the road to get you to stop doing that, right? Like a speed bump or a stop sign or eventually cops probably, traffic lights, U-turns. They will try and make you use the road correctly, but it stays a road. It was always a road. We're not going to take the road apart because people won't use it correctly. Same thing with an algorithm, any algorithm. The rules stay the same but the updates sit on top of them to try to make you use them correctly. Um, so back to my favorite point, don't rely on paid to save you. Um, and I normally talk about this more, but Google ads are punitive. They are, they're not there as a profit center for Google, the way that like a commercial TV ad is for like NBC. Google ads are requested by brands. What Google wants is for your website to be clean, clear, actionable, easy to read, that it can look at, index quickly, and give to someone else. Ads exist because brands were like, instead of fixing my website, can I just pay you? Can I just pay a penalty to be first? And Google was like, that seems dumb, but okay. What that means is when you are buying an ad for an organic rank that you should already have, and you should, for whatever it is that you offer, you should be whatever position you should be organically. If you need to buy the difference, you're announcing to Google that you're not going to fix your website, that you're, that you're aware that you're just going to buy the difference. Because your organic score out of 100 goes towards your bid floor. So back to you can use ads for incrementality, no problem. They should be pretty cheap, though. Right, like if you're already Nike, you might need to buy ads to announce a new product because no one's ever heard of it. But you, this is unfortunately not true for Nike, but if you have a good rank for being Nike, you're not paying for that part. You're just paying for the new product part, which should be like 10 cents a click. 
That's not true for Nike. Nike.com does not have a good organic rank, even on its own branded search terms, which means that Nike needs to pay to Google to prove to Google that it's Nike before it can even buy an ad. So its ads are going to be like $5.10 per click. The 10 cents is for the keyword. The $5 is to pay Google because Google doesn't know if you're Nike or not. Google doesn't know if I'm Nike or not. That also, by and by, is how you can do conquesting. So the idea of advertising against your direct competitors' branded keywords shouldn't be physically possible, right? Because your brand is your brand and you have the legal documents to prove it and your website should be pretty clear. Your, your brand is something you legally own. But if Google can't prove it, you're going to have to pay the difference between what you say you do and what they can prove you do. That difference might be the same difference between Nike and Adidas. It is. Neither of them have a great branded go-to-market, so both of them are purveyors of sports stuff. Either one can claim that they're Nike. Both of them will have to pay the penalty to be able to buy that ad, but they can buy that ad because Google has no idea which one is which. What you want to do is make sure that Google knows who you are, and then if you feel like adding ads on top of it, that they're inexpensive. And I, I think I say this like eight times in this presentation, hacks are a great way to lose money. Please don't do them. They're from emotional dysregulation. I fully understand that there are reactions to an emotional state that is like painful, difficult, annoying. Your business and your money are probably fairly stressful things. Having competitors is a stressful thing. Trying to sell products and talk about what your customers need and like run your business, all of that is very stressful, which makes us want to do a hack rather than the kind of like slow, steady, do it correctly. Really, it's like dieting. It's not like all of us don't know that if you sleep enough and drink enough water and eat good food that you'll be pretty healthy, but I, I'll speak for myself. I have definitely done some bonkers diets. I have definitely tried to consume those like teas that make you like sick to your stomach before an event. So you'll be like skinny. They're not good for you. They make it way harder to be healthier later. It does not move you towards your goal. It wastes a ton of time, a ton of money, usually some version of your health and it doesn't move the needle, right? Like if I want to be healthy, that's a many pronged thing. Losing two pounds is not my only goal in being healthy, but it is the only thing that a diet tea will do for me. Same thing with hacks. You might get a 1% increase, but you may have cost yourself a 700% increase. So be careful. Slash don't do that. Okay, how is Google rating your site? Again, Google specific. So most search engines are pretty similar to this, but Google specific. It is broken into two scores, a quality score and a relevancy score that are 50% each. The quality score is things like the hosting platform you're on, the level of security on your website, the user experience on your website, the user interface that you built on your website, which are two different things that they're measuring, site load speed. Essentially, like, could a grandmother use the website is basically what your quality score is. Your relevancy score, which is also 50%, is how close are you to the query? So your Google, your quality score rather is all the time. It's just like how, how good, how technically good is your website? Your relevancy score is against customer queries. So you don't only have one customer, you have customers that ask for lots of things, probably. It's relevancy to them. So that will kind of like shift with the queries as they come through. But it's basically like, does Google understand that you solve their problem? And the way that Google decides that is within site structure. So the two scores are quality score and relevancy score, 50% each. You do need both, like we talked about earlier. Site structure is how Google figures out how relevant you are. What that means is you like mentally picture a Excel spreadsheet, like the, like the grid on top of your homepage. A crawler takes in information from left to right, then from top to bottom, then first page to last page. Kind of like reading a book in the Western Hemisphere. Kind of like reading a like English style book. Which means that there are more important and less important places on your website to put information. Upper left is the most important real estate on your website by a very, very, very large margin. The upper left quadrant of your website is where you want to put your most pressing important information so that Google understands what you do. And so the people in the Western Hemisphere who are going to start their reading there also understand what you do. Because again, a search engine is just watching human behavior. Did a human get it? Did my grandma get it? Is she able to buy your thing from you without calling me into the room? She's not going to scroll down. She's not going to click everything. She's not going to look around to find it. 
she's going to open what she can perceives to be the first page, the beginning of the first page of your website. And is her answer there? If it's not, she's probably going to bounce, which is why we have a 47% bounce rate. Okay. Um, does anybody want to play the game? Yeah. yeah. Maybe. You got okay, a you yes in the chat. Maybe. Yeah. Two yeses. Okay. You don't have to come off. You don't have to be on video if you don't want to. Um, you do need to come off mute though. So as long as you're comfortable, um, there's going to be like a yelling phone. In. You're just going to like yell out your answer. to what is happening in the game. As long as you're comfortable with that, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I'm only going to do a couple of these and then I will do kind of like a, a final slide and then we'll do questions. So the game, I have taken screenshots of several websites and I have covered the logo and I have covered a picture of the product if it was a product site with a logo on it. So essentially we're gonna do the grammar test on websites. And the game is we're gonna hold it up and you're gonna tell me what you think the website does, what it is, what it's for, if they're selling something, what they're selling. Does that sound good? Okay. Amazing. Uh, we'll do a practice one too. I'm gonna do a really obvious practice one just so we like get into like the flow. What do we think this website does? Uh, paint. Thank For. You. Interior design. What? Interior design. Interior design, yeah. Furniture. Excellent, excellent guesses. Interior design is really close. Actually, that's awesome. It's an architecture firm. Wow. Not an interior architecture firm, an architecture firm in Brooklyn. Beautiful website, honestly. Like the images are gorgeous. There are no words anywhere on it. Like I could have, I could have taken a screenshot anywhere. Because you don't know, right? Like paint's a good guess. Window treatments is a good guess. Furniture is a good guess. But no, architecture. Is my grandma gonna look at this and be like, oh, when we need to build a building, we're gonna use them? Like, of course not. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so practice one. Um, what does this website do? Uh travel. I guess. Alcohol. Excellent guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thinking alcohol. Yeah. I would have said vacation before I saw a sip. Travel. Okay. Phenomenal guesses. It's a soda brand. Soda. Soda. Healthy soda. So this is normally where I do the like beautiful imagery is important, but it's also really misleading, right? Like this is beautiful. It's a lovely ad campaign, like orchids, water, beaches, like so pretty. It's to sell kind of like off-brand Diet Coke. Like, I don't know that you would get diet from this. I don't know <laughs> that you would get soda from this. Um, someone said they saw the word sip. That is the only like drink associated part of this website, right? So the only thing they sell is drinks. And I will also say from a navigation perspective, the only scrapable words on here. So like a search engine needs context, right? We talked about like images don't mean anything. It's just like a gray square. This game is really boring. The first way I did it was only gray squares and it was like, oh, all of these suck. So don't do it that way. But the only words on here that are scrapable are the word shop, learn, and subscribe. Do you get I sell soda from shop, learn, or subscribe? No. Right. If you don't sell shops, do not have the word shop on your navigation. If you are not a teacher, do not have the word learn on your navigation. Subscribe. You can have a subscription model for soda. Like I kind of see where they were going with that, but it's not clear in the navigation, right? Like, would my grandma get it is an important question. I'm like, no, she's not gonna get this at all. Mm. Okay, what do we think this one is? Uh, clothing brand. Yeah, mm. shoes, sneakers. <laughs> I can't. Camping. Outdoor clothes. These are really good guesses, really good guesses. It is clothing, it's athletic clothing. The brand is Viore. But what words are on this website? Explore. Explorers. That can mean anything. Yeah. That can mean anything. And also, excellent point. A word embedded on a an image does not count as a word. It's not scrapable. So everyday oh. explorer is not readable. Mm. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> so would wow. it just be women and men at the top then? Women, men, community. Wow. Which, you know, so from a search engine, right? The most important part of this website is this upper left-hand corner. The only thing that's in it is women men. Mm. If I if I were searching for like best yoga pants for hiking, um, Google doesn't know that they exist, right? And this brand in particular pays a, a lot in advertising. 
because their Google doesn't know their website exists, right? It doesn't rank for anything. That's where the margin gets lost. This is a good brand with good product that people do like that they buy consistently, but they cannot get traffic to their website because Google cannot put them in any index. Their index is women, men, community. You're not, when I Google like best whatever, you're not gonna come up for it, right? Okay, um, you may already know this brand. If you know this brand, don't say it, but what do you think this website does? Mm. I thought cars, but I think lipstick now. <laughs> Yeah, makeup. Say donuts. I'm confused. Wait, what? Makeup or skincare? I think futures has me confused more than anything. But I see donut. Um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Excellent point. It is a makeup company. Um, what? Yeah. Yeah, it's Road Makeup, which is Haley Bieber's makeup company. Um, it does say lip treat. In fairness, a search engine can't scrape it. Again, it's like embedded on the image. So none of those words count. In fairness, to people guessing you could probably land on beauty. I will say that their, their homepage, the first bit of their homepage is just a video of Haley walking around. This is the only shot of her face. I like slowly clicked through it. So it would be like a little more fair. Most of it's a shot of her like bum as she's walking away, like holding donuts. And not that she's not a beautiful woman, but like, that's not how you sell lip gloss. This right? is... What's the point of the Krispy Kreme though? <laughs> I'm not so percent clear. I it's either I would assume it's like a is it a partnership? Um, I don't did know. Did like a strawberry lip treatment recently, and she did like a collab with Krispy Kreme. Okay, um, <laughs> this is interesting. But I have noticed that celebrity websites are pretty bad. They're terrible. Yeah, consistently terrible. Which for for reasonable reasons, right? Because you're like, oh, Haley Bieber is a beautiful person and she's very well known. It's very easy to mistake the fact that people care that Haley Bieber exists with they care about Haley Bieber in the context of makeup, which they don't. Yeah. Haley Bieber being famous is not the same thing as Haley Bieber makes good lip gloss. Exactly. So when their marketing is like Haley Bieber is famous, you're like, okay, but this is even the only shot of her lips. Like, what does a lip gloss look like? Is it pretty? Does it feel good? Is it shiny? Is it the reasons you would buy it are not Haley Bieber. Yeah. Right. So when you're Googling it, you're Googling like shiny lip gloss, strawberry lip gloss, et cetera. Um, yes to whoever said futures makes no sense. This is a this is a rough navigation. This is a tough one. Um, okay, those were those were it for the game. You guys are much faster than people normally are, which is amazing. Um, so I have a version of what like perfect looks like, or if you want, we can do some of your websites and or am I speaking on turn and we have yeah, we have 20 minutes left. We do have some questions in the chat too, if we have time for that. Okay, we definitely have time for questions in the chat. Do you guys want to see what a like a mock of a good one looks like, or do you want? To Can I see a good one? website? <laughs> um, this is not a real website. This is a mock up that I made for this talk. So this is not HubSpot's actual website. However, the reason that it's good is one, it loads really fast. It loads really fast because there's no video, there's no pop up, there's no images. You definitely don't want video anywhere in your homepage. Ever, ever. There's never a reason to have video on your homepage. If you have amazing videos, use them in your social. If you have cool videos that you can take GIFs of, put those in your product detail pages so that you don't get slapped for how long it takes to load a video, which is eons. Like civilizations rise and fall on the time it takes to load a video to a website. We're on mobile. The second part to images is images are for brands. They're not for people. Images don't mean anything without context. So the information is 99.9% .9 of the game. You can add images after if they're light enough. If you think that it will like really add to the value, add them after, but information first. Um, and I always tell you to take down your pop-ups because they will slow down your site load spine. And people don't know yet that they want your product for 10% off. Like there's not really a reason for a pop-up on the home screen. If there is a reason to capture emails. You do want people's emails, but a pop-up is maybe not the best way to do it. So all of that is stripped out of this. Why is this good? based on search data for people who are trying to purchase CRMs is how I set it up. The first most important thing they care about is CRM software. That is the most important thing that people Google when buying a CRM. So the first word on our website is going to be software because that's the most important thing to the people. The second thing most frequently Googled with regard to a CRM is how much it costs. The third most important thing is like, how do I 
with the expectation of like videos or articles. So people will want the software, then they want to know what it costs, then they want to know how to use it. Going left to right in the top panel, then people frequently are bifurcated on wanting a free version and wanting a demo for like a professional version. So in order, based on search demand, we have software, then pricing, then resources, then free, then demo. I'm doing that based on the volume of search so that we are very relevant to their queries, right? The site already loads quickly. The user experience is super easy. Like my grandma's gonna be able to come right here and be like, oh, software and click on it, no problem. Super great rank. The next section, so that's the navigation. Next section is the hero. You have to have copy in your hero, have to have to. If you also want an image, go for it. Make the image a square and put it over to the right. Left has to be because left is more important than right. You need to have text in the hero on the left, not on top of the image. It needs to be its own separate text box in which you're going to talk about other things people would search for. So HubSpot is a CRM platform. Again, back to software. All of the tools and integrations you need for marketing, sales, content management, and customer service. Those in order are what people Googled for a CRM platform. I need a marketing CRM, I need a sales CRM, I need a content CRM, I need a service CRM. Each product in the platform is powerful alone, but the real magic happens when you use them together. The seventh and eighth things that people Googled were, can you buy them piecemeal or do they come in a set? Can you buy it all at once, like one-stop shop, or can you buy them individually? Again, we're repeating free or demo, paid demo. Again, we're repeating. Here's marketing, separate if you only want marketing. Here is sales, separate if you only want sales. Here is, I covered it with my thing, here is service if you only want service. This is laid out against the way that people query for when they are trying to buy the solution to their problem, which is marketing sales and customer service are tough, and we need a place to run all that software. Does that make sense? It's boring and ugly, but ugly websites convert really, really well. So you basically saying that you should not have an image on on your homepage. Like it should it should be all words. That's basically what you're saying. Perfect is all words. Oh wow. Interesting. That's not really what people the brand owners hate that. So like if you really need an image, put one in, but like one. No video. Never a video. Video no, the only reason why I say no, I mean, I don't I don't say yes or no. I I I I take your word for it, but I just feel like if you're a service provider, right, like myself, and you're not like a celebrity entrepreneur guru, like as I call them, like a Marie Folio or whatever, right? Like, so people, I think people want to see you. Maybe I'm, I'm making, a, maybe not, maybe they don't. So I don't know. I, I thought that people wanted to see like, oh, well, who's this person? Um, would she be relatable or whatever? I don't know, but maybe. Uh, That's maybe. a great question. That is a great question. From a human psychological standpoint, people like faces. Yeah. So like in your social media or if you ran ads, you definitely want your face because people visually love that. When people are searching for a problem, they're not going to Google a picture of your face to find you. Mm. Right? So yeah. you do want to explain it first. Having your face somewhere on the website can be good. Yeah. But so where do you suggest you put your face if you want to put your face somewhere? If you want to put your face and you want it above the fold, put it right here. I don't know if you can see me move the cursor, but like split that hero section into two pieces. On most templates, it's like a long rectangle. So mm -hmm. you go into your template and you like right click it and change the shape and it will give you for, for most platforms, it will give you two squares. Put the text in the square on the left and put your picture on the right. Okay. And keep it small. Do not put pings in there. Make sure it's a JPEG. Make sure it's a small JPEG. Pings take forever to load. Okay. Thank you for that. That's interesting. It'll speed up your traffic a lot. Anything, anything else before we dive into the chat questions? No. Can videos be added if they are embedded somewhere instead of uploaded to the site? Yes, just not on the homepage, Michelle. So the deeper they are in the, so back to like the first page matters more than subsequent pages. If you're gonna do something that's gonna slow your site down, where you get your site speed score is from the homepage first. So don't put anything heavy on the homepage. If you love your video and you need to have it on there, 
put it somewhere deeper. I would also say though, that it is gonna slow down your site. And for every second your site slows, site slows down, you lose about 37% of your potential traffic. So just like make sure the video is worth it. Like a, like a sizzle reel is not what you want in there. You want the video to be something like very, very, very helpful. The Google Inside Track. Would it depend on how the word is put on the site? I.e. if it's on the image, it's not scrapable, but if the word is built into the site as a title or something like that, would it be scrapable? Um, titles are scrapable, but they are lower in the order of operations. So like meta tagging matters. You definitely should meta tag an image, but it's like 50th on the list of things the search engine is looking for. So like definitely do it, but it won't make up for the fact if you don't have copy somewhere else. So same thing with like, if you're doing like a header or a subheader or within like the H1 or the footer, et cetera. Yes, you can put scrapable things there. They don't matter as much as an actual text box copy. I don't know if Michelle is still on, did that answer your question? Michelle still on? Maybe not. Um, yeah, it looks like. Yep, she said yes, great, thanks. Oh, awesome. Uh, we so got another should... question from Twana. Um, where would you put a lead, lead magnet? On your website? Yeah, no, most, most people tell you to put like the lead magnet above the fold and so forth. And so you don't know. Um, your lead magnet should be something to drive people to your website. So like a webinar, a freebie, a, a call, or whatever would be offsite and then you drive them into your site. Um, I do see a lot of people talk about having like the pop-ups for email capture on your homepage. You do want to capture emails. You don't want to do it by like shock and awe. Like you don't want to be like, bah! when someone comes to your website, people hate pop-ups, universally, psychologically, emotionally hate pop-ups because it takes them out of the flow. So first I'm gonna hit on pop-ups for a second. When you're going to someone's website, it's for a purpose. Like I wanna to talk to Tawana about X thing. When the pop-up comes up, I'm just like, Whoop. and then I read the pop-up. I stopped caring about Tawana while I'm trying to figure out why this thing jumped in front of me. So psychologically, you don't wanna do that. Could you ask for it later? Yes, your website should have probably a couple spaces on it that are like, connect with us, reach out to us. Like, you know, like give us your information in some way. You can have it come later, you can create an event, um, depending on the platform, well, all platforms do it, but you can create an event, which is sort of like person has clicked on three things and you can have one pop up that's like, do you have questions? Do you want us to like help you with something? Particularly for like a service provider, the like, are you finding what you're looking for can happen. I will say though, that if people are struggling to find what they're looking for on your website, the pop up's not gonna fix it, the copy would fix it. Like oh. you want to be more like, hey, this is what we do. This is who it's for. This is who wants us. This is who shouldn't pay attention to us. In terms of getting emails, like, yeah, you want them, but they're, you don't want them more than a productive website. So I would say oh. that from, from like a let's stay in touch perspective, have it on your website. And if you must do a pop-up, do it not on the homepage, do it like a couple clicks in. Well, I don't have a pop-up, but I have a quiz as a way to capture emails. Quizzes are fun. And it's above the fold. And it's embedded in your homepage? Um, I believe it. I believe it is. Well, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a clickable. Yeah. It's a link that when you click on it, take it, another page comes. Yeah. So it is embedded. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Um, that is fair. You can put that above the fold. I would say, without looking at it, weigh out whether you want someone to go somewhere else or not. So like quizzes are very fun and they can be great for getting emails. They kind of need to be perfect for them to be getting you good emails. So there's an element of like, if they're already on your website and I sell skincare and you're gonna struggle to find which skincare bottle is best for you, a quiz could be helpful for that. Mm, if you're okay. on my website and I'm like a doctor, you shouldn't be taking a quiz. You should just be contacting me immediately, right? So like there's a layer of like, is the quiz helping you? Is it giving you good information? If it's not, but it's just fun, like maybe put it below the fold, but like in the second box. If it's oh. something where you're like, people need this quiz to be able to find their thing, I think that's valuable. And you can leave oh, it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think, I, I thank you so much. This has been extraordinarily helpful. Thank you so much, Catherine. I, my question is, um, you mentioned 
you know, the problem, you know, doing things that people can see the information with this example you have up. So how do you go about searching for the things that they will be searching for in order to include those things into the body? That way, you know, you're hitting those nuggets. Great question. So it's going to mess it up if I... Let me, let me stop sharing for a second and then I will show you an example from Google. So Google has a couple of free ones, a couple of free tools you can do this with. Mm -hmm. um, Google Trends is the best way to do that. Um, so we go into just, I think it's trends.google.com. And you can put in the query of what you think the person wants. Right, so I will tell you with mine, I definitely thought people wanted a digi digital commerce consultant and that's not what they were looking for. So you can kind of like check through here and be like, well, if they, so what do you do? What problem do you solve? Um, so I'm a, a transformational life coach. So when you use this tool, um, take a look at the filters. So you probably want like in the last year. Mm. If this comes up for you, and if you didn't call yourself a life coach, what else would you, what do people say they want from you? Uh, many people come to me to heal trauma. I'm a, I'm a healer. I also do creative coaching. Creative coaching? Mm -hmm. Which is specifically to help creators move out of a, a, a space where they don't feel like their ideas belong in the world. They don't feel important enough. So we get their creative, their ideas out in the world. Successful. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. well, that's very cool. Thank you. I'm sure it's very helpful. So you would put in what you think they're searching for. Okay. And then over time, um, don't look at this graph. This graph is, um, without going too deep into it, search has a bunch of different components to it. So broad search and exact and phrase will like throw the graph off. So ignore, ignore the graph. But you want to go down here and be like, do the related queries make sense to me? So like, okay, we're, we're getting hits on coach, but it's people who are coaches. Other people who are life coaches, but it's their name slash life coach, mm. which means that they're getting credit and you you aren't. Like people are looking for life coaches, but they're looking for a famous person's name than life Almost coach. Name. Right. Um, unless you are famous. So there's a call out there too that like if to a service provider, if you are famous or you're going to be famous, yes, include your name in your face. If you aren't going to be famous or if the assumption I, claim, is I claim I claim it I claim it <laughs> amazing. amazing okay you're going to be famous so okay. you're going to be like you know just like a general kind of like financial analyst mm -hmm. you're not assuming you're going to be the world's most famous financial analyst so in that regard you'd want the search terms to not be name focused so one work on being famous but two people do google life coach but not but they do it by name so we would need to find out like what else they think life coaching is if they don't have a person in mind mm. And so it's like, see how these don't make a lot, of, a lot of times they use the word feeling stuck and how to get unstuck. So maybe that might be. I'm going to close this one out because what came up were hospitals. Oh, interesting. Yes. Well, trauma, right? So like that's where search can throw it off that the word trauma is used in lots and lots of places. So you probably wouldn't rank for it. Okay. So. Unstuck is a fun one, um, but mostly tongue unstuck from freezer, small cylinder yeah. unstuck. Okay, so maybe it doesn't 100% apply to life coaching, but there probably is a way that they describe it that does. So I would suggest, um, and I'll put this link in the chat because it's usually pretty useful for this. That, let me close this one, so not fighting with Google. It's a good one to kind of play around with and just be like, am I describing the thing that other people are describing? And related queries is where you will find the other things that they talk about. Oh, and great. that can sort of help you kind of reshift it where you're like, okay, they maybe don't say trauma, but like, what do they say? Right. Perfect. Could be right. difficulty X, Y, Z. Could be, again, we had a financial analyst client who kept talking about the, um, it was like broadly like wealth management, et cetera. And it was like people who will literally the, the name of the form. So like you need to say that you do the forms because people who need a financial analyst do not say wealth management. They say they need like an HB 99 or whatever. Right. So make sure that that is up and left on your website. 
when you say what you're offering to people, you want to use their language. So it'd be like, come to us for like, da -da 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 -da. then go into the various filters. So if you're a product business and you sell skincare, you're going to talk about the fact that it's like anti-aging and it's good for sensitive skin. It's good for drying. If you are a coach of some kind, you're offering your services, but in their language. Right. So like we help creatives do X, Y, Z thing that creatives have complained about. I just realized by you saying that people pleasing is big amongst clients they they love that they use that term quite a bit yeah. Yeah. Nice. thank you oh you're so welcome you see homepage email mock-ups are doing well the delay over they just went to the seo ariana yes they are detrimental to seo um but this is a this is a trade-off if you're getting a ton of emails from your pop-ups and they're not on the homepage it's worse than the homepage so the fact that it's not on the homepage is definitely better awesome in general, it's detrimental to SEO because they're often very heavy. It's a very fat piece of code that slows down your site. So you do not need more JavaScript on your website and it needs to be purposeful. If you are getting a ton of really functional traffic from your pop-up, then that's maybe a fine trade-off for you. I would really strongly suggest that you look at how you measure working well and see how good the emails are. So like, what number of people, percentage of people are signing up and what percentage of people are then working with you from sharing their email. Because this impacts bounce rate really heavily. People detest, fire of a thousand suns detest pop-ups and it is a huge component of the bounce rate. In your case, it's going to show up in an exit rate because yours isn't on your homepage, it's deeper, but it doesn't mean it's not pissing people off, which is hard to measure, right? Like people aren't like announcing their exit, they're just leaving. So I would say like, really take a look at how valuable it is for you. And if it is awesome for you, amazing. And if it's not, maybe like scoot it around. Oh, business you work with. Yeah, I mean, I, of the like several hundred brands I've done this for, it has never been worth more than like an 85th of 1% of revenue. I've never seen a pop-up be valuable. Not to say that it isn't somewhere, but just that I, usually it's not. What do you think of a clickable company logo in the top left corner? Um, what do you mean what I think of it? Um, I was talk. <laughs> uh it, it, it's like clickable if you're on like a different page it will bring you back to the home page i think that's very useful for bringing you back to a home page okay um for seo logos don't mean anything like it's just an image so yeah you don't get anything out of it but it is useful for having it be like a return to home okay that helps <laughs> yeah sorry not a great answer I mean, people love logos in the left-hand corner, a great place to put it. Your logo should be your home page. That is actually a great point. You do not want the word home. You don't want to yeah. call out, like, click this to go home. So having your logo be clickable to bring you home is the correct way to do the structure. In terms of, like, getting credit for it, you don't. So okay. I hope your navigation is good. But, like, yes, that's where you'd want to put the home button. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know about the image. I didn't know that. So that it's just gray. <laughs> gray matter. I know. Isn't that sad? <laughs> like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, cool. We're just at the top of the hour. Thank you so much for all your great questions. And thank you, Catherine, for sharing your expertise with us today. A lot of good insights came out. So I will share Catherine's links again in the chat. If anyone wants to connect with her, you can find her at these links I just dropped. Uh, the session is recorded, so I will be sending out the recording after. Um, and yeah, look, look forward to me in your inbox soon. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you soon <laughs> in your inbox. Thank you, you all, friends. Have a great thank day. Thank you so much. It's been such a good session. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy your Wednesday, friends. Take it easy. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Katie.